Hey everyone, welcome to The Wild Layer, a documentary series about the animals we share our planet with. I'm your host Kevin, and today we're going to be talking about Phascolarctos cinereus, or as you probably know them, koalas. And if you're asking yourself if my pronunciation comes from World of Warcraft, good ear, because it totally does. Sometimes mistakenly called koala bears, Phascolarctos cinereus is in fact a marsupial, a primitive mammal which gives birth to live, underdeveloped young and nurses them in a pouch. Koala do not belong to the family Ursidae. They are not bears. But they are another monotypic species, like Lycaon pictus, who we discussed last time, and humans, meaning that they are the only extant species in their genus. The scientific name for the koala, Phascolarctos cinereus, comes from the Greek, not the Latin, for pouched bear, and ash gray, so it's particularly descriptive for the small marsupial, but a little odd. While they do resemble bears at first glance, the koala is vastly different. Let's dive in. Found solely in Australia, the koala is an arboreal folivore, which is a fancy word for any animal who subsists on a diet of leaves, just like the giant panda, Alleropoda melanoleuca, restricted to the eucalyptus forests. More precisely, there are about 35 varieties of the 600 or so species of eucalyptus indigenous to Australia that Phascolarctos cinereus lives in and feeds on. Historically, these forests were much more widespread across the continent, extending from North Queensland to the southeastern corner of the continent in Victoria. Today, the koala and its eucalyptus forests are drastically reduced to eastern and southeastern coastal regions of the continent, which, with some dispersion in regional inland areas in close proximity of these coastal regions. Phascolarctos cinereus today is found in the states of Queensland, New South Wales, Victoria, and South Australia, but only in the far southeastern corner, including Kangaroo Island, also known as Carta, which means Island of the Dead. On average, these animals are about 62 centimeters in length, which is nearly 2 feet long, and weigh in at about 9 kilos, or roughly 20 pounds. They have thick, woolly fur which protects them from the elements like wind and rain, and acts as an insulation against the heat and the cold. As an arboreal species, they have a number of critical adaptations, including the unique structure of their hands, which feature two innermost opposable digits, as opposed to the one opposable digit you typically see on so many other arboreal species. In addition to these, they have strong hook-shaped claws on all of their fingers and toes, except the opposable digit on their feet, which afford them a superior grip. With this articulation and grip, they also have an incredible reach between hand and foot, hand to hand, and foot to foot, which affords them a greater ability to traverse great distances between branches with ease. All of these adaptations work together in concert for supremely well-adapted life in the trees. Folivores like the koala have to eat a lot every day to gather enough nutrients to sustain themselves. And even for a small animal like Phascolarctos cinereus, which again tops out at around 9 kilos, that's a large diet every day. A diet of leaves is not an energy efficient one, and as such, most folivores are precariously close to the limits of their energy budget each day. Add this to the fact that their food source is toxic, and you'd be in good company if you're asking yourself whether the koala is dead set against itself. But this clever animal has a trick up its sleeve. Or seesum. Let's not think about that joke too hard. A seesum, which is a pouch-like addendum attached to the intestines, and makes up nearly 20% of the digestive tract of Phascolarctos cinereus, enables these creatures to digest the nitrogen-rich diet of toxic leaves from the eucalyptus forests in which they reside. Essentially, it serves as a fermentation chamber, which allows the koala to detoxify the oils and, sim and symbiotic microorganisms in their digestive tract to break down the cellulose in the leaves themselves. Think of it as a way for the species to slow walk their diet through the digestive process and render it safe. Now you may have heard that koala don't drink water, and in a very literal sense that's often true. They rarely come down from the trees to actively drink water from streams, rivers, lakes, ponds, puddles, etc. But it's because they gather enough moisture from the leaves that they eat every day that they don't have to. Now, unfortunately, in drought conditions, when the leaves aren't holding enough water to satisfy their hydration requirements, that the koala's behavioral patterns don't lead to success. Because they're not inclined to seek out alternative sources of water, they can die from dehydration or toxicity 
either from nitrogen or the oils in the eucalyptus leaves, relatively easily, especially in a changing climate where droughts are becoming more prevalent. It's not uncommon to find a sea specimen with full stomachs and a, a packed sesum, which in theory and in a hydrated environment should have supplied the animal with all the water it needed, but in a dehydrated environment actually poisons the animal because of lack of water and high nitrogen levels and toxic oils from the eucalyptus. While the koala was once abundant, it was originally the arrival of white settlers from Europe, which vastly reduced their numbers. Hunted for their fur from the settlers' first arrival in the 1600s up to 1927, the species was very nearly close to extinction throughout its natural range. During this time, millions of specimens were taken from the wild through the large export industry in the territories which eventually became the states of Victoria, New South Wales, and Queensland. And although the practices were officially banned in Victoria State in, 18, in the 1890s, it continued under regulation until 1927 in other areas. And while the IUCN states that there's no evidence that the commercial harvesting had any long-term impacts on the overall population, the species has been in recovery ever since. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at the reproductive rates and characteristics of Fascolarctos cinereus for a moment, and I think you'll see what I'm getting at. Females, who only cycle in the winter each year, typically only breed every two years, which puts an initial limiting factor on reproduction at the outset, especially for a species trying to recover from near-extinction level harvesting nearly a century ago. In fact, according to the IUCN, the yearly average for female reproduction rates is between 0.3 and 0.8 a year per female, which means that the reproductive rate is less than 1 per year per female. That's negative growth. On top of that, studies suggest that females are induced ovulators, which means that fe the female ovulates only after copulation by a mechanism which we don't fully understand but which is suspected to be voluntary or controlled, or by choice for lack of a better term. And that further complicates breeding viability because it's, it means that, the, that a successful mating may not necessarily be viable, and mating in the wild is, well, kind of hard to come by. Males avoid each other, rather than battling it out for breeding rights or territory. In fact, only 4% of observed interactions between males resulted in any kind of physical altercation in one 2011 study. And while males avoiding each other doesn't sound like a problem for reproduction, it becomes one when you factor in that male territories can be two square kilometers, and that males' reluctance to interact essentially shifts the honest to mate onto the female. It's not completely reversed, the traditional roles are still present, with males seeking out females, but you can imagine how it's complicated and difficult in such an environment. Given that gestation only takes approximately 35 days, followed by six months of the joey nursing in the pouch and then an additional six months on the mother's back, reproduction itself is relatively quick, but getting to that point is rather arduous. Now joeys emerge in a practically embryonic state, as it's typical with most marsupials, and find their way into the mother's pouch where they latch onto one of two nipples and begin to nurse. But further complicating reproduction is the chlamydia epidemic confronting the wild populations of Fascolarctos cinereus, which we'll discuss a little later, that can result in sterility and eventually death. So the species is truly recovering. It's a little odd, I think, to say that there are no long-term impacts from the large-scale harvesting of the species. But that's just, like, my opinion, man. Now, we've touched on a few of the threats to Fascolarctos cinereus so far, like climate change and hunting. So let's turn to the challenges that they face in the wild today. According to the IUCN, current threats to the species include continued habitat destruction, fragmentation, and modification, which makes them vulnerable to predation by dogs, vehicle strikes, and other factors, bushfires and disease, as well as drought-associated mortality in habitat fragments. A, ha a recent IUCN report, Species and Climate Change, released on the 14th of December 2009, lists the koala as one of the 10 species in the world destined to be hardest hit by climate change. Populations of Fascolarctos cinereus continue to decline across their modern range on average. In fact, over three generations, which is approximately 18 to 24 years, it's estimated that the species has undergone around 28% reduction as of 2012, according to one study. 
a rate significantly influenced by a decline in the inland range of the species, which is most exposed to drought conditions brought on by climate change. A separate, independent estimate from the same time frame calculated a mean population reduction of 29% across all bioregions. That's the negative growth I mentioned earlier in action, coupled with mortality due to habitat loss and reduction. Further, due to drought conditions, partially caused by human-induced climate change and partially caused by irrigation efforts for urban development and agriculture, have increased the occurrence and severity of bushfires, leading to widespread habitat destruction. The most recent threat these adorable marsupials have faced, as we are all at least somewhat aware, are the devastating bushfires that have ravaged the Australian continent. In a time when we're all hunkered down at home due to the global viral pandemic and the mass attention has been shifted to the threat humanity is facing from SARS-CoV-2, the novel coronavirus that causes COVID-19, it's important to remember that only a few brief weeks ago, the largest landmass in Oceania was engulfed in flames. The recent bushfires in Australia, spurred on by record-breaking drought and heat waves across the continent, reached temperatures as high as 41.9 degrees centigrade in December during the Australian summer, transforming the continent into a wasteland of ash and smoke. Beginning in early September 2019, bushfires killed upwards of a billion animals, including more than 25,000 koalas. Officials caution that these estimates are, were a guessing game, and that exact figures are as yet unknown, but that early reports of koalas being functionally extinct are largely inaccurate and exaggerated, which is a good thing. Like California in the United States, Australia is no stranger to fire season. However, the 2019-2020 season was a particularly devastating aberration, in part because of the Indian Ocean Dipole, or IOD. The IOD is an oceanic surface temperature variation that drives weather, pa weather patterns across Oceania, including the Indian monsoon. In its strongest phase in more than 20 years, which resulted in cooler surface temperatures across the Australian coastal seas, and thus far less storm and rainfall activity in the region, the dipole set up a perfect storm for this record-breaking drought. Now, other challenges facing the koala are habitat fragmentation, which we discussed last time with the African painted dog, and disease. So let's talk about disease specifically, as it impacts Vascularctos cinereus conservation and survival in the wild. The koala in the wild is, by some estimates, almost completely inundated with infection from the bacterial organism Chlamydia stasi. Not to be confused with the STI of and commonly called by the same genus Chlamydia, Chlamydia stasi is an avian vector and is spread by birds of all kinds. It can also spread into humans causing a zoonotic respiratory illness called, called stasicosis, which is a pneumonia-like disease with flu-like early stage symptoms. Vascularctos cinereus likely came into contact with Chlamydia stasi through casual contact with birds or bird droppings in the eucalyptus trees in which the marsupials reside. And because the highly infectious bacteria can spread through inhalation, ingestion, or contact, it's very likely that repeated multiple exposures have sustained the broad population infection. According to one study, as many as 50% of sampled specimens tested positive for chlamydia stasi, with anywhere between 14 and 47% of the sample group showing clinical symptoms. Other sources, including National Geographic, suggest that some or all of wild populations, as recently as 2008, reflect a 100% infection rate. Chlamydia stasi is lethal and can lead to blindness, bladder inflammation, and infertility long before death particularly distressing in a species which already has a low to negative rate of reproduction. Now, Joey's contraction of the disease is nearly guaranteed because of the development cycle of feeding from their mother's pap, which is essentially nutrient-dense fecal matter that the Joey transitions to between nursing and feeding on eucalyptus on their own. This stage of development is essential as it's when the Joey's acquire from their mothers the intestinal flora and fauna which aid in the digestion and detoxification of eucalyptus. Unfortunately, the standard treatment for stasicosis in humans and other animals is broad-spectrum uh, 
and other animals, broad-spectrum antibiotic treatment is a death sentence for the intestinal biome upon which the koala relies to digest and detoxify its food source, which would render it unable to survive. Fortunately, however, there is hope. Research led by former UC Davis doctoral student, now Dr. Catherine Dahlhausen, on digestive microbiomes of Fascolarctos cinereus has led to alternative therapies and augmentative therapeutics to increase the success of antibiotic treatment. Things like probiotics, fecal transplants, and a koala-specific chlamydia stasi vaccine are all being investigated, the latter of which has done well in clinical trials. You can check out a really cool article from the UC Davis College of Biological Sciences about Dr. Dahlhausen's research in the further reading section of the doobly-doo down below. That's all for today. Thank you so much for joining me on this dive into Fascolarctos cinereus, the koala. Check out the references in the description and some suggested reading for those of you hungry to learn more. Articles from JSTOR can be accessed through your local library, so make sure you've got your membership card. I've also posted some links to koala conservation efforts and research projects for those of you interested in ways to help support these fantastic polar in the wild and, and further our understanding of their roles in the global ecosystem. Until next time, stay wild.